Um, <laughs> I had an elder tell me it was really sweet and it makes me feel really good about it. Whenever I go on tangents, it's ancestors speaking through me. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ross must be really close to that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Welcome everyone, I'm the Captain Ross Memphis Pambert, and with me is the co-host and my friend, the President, Lawrence Gervais. We're broadcasting from Calgary and Region 3 of the Métis Nation of Alberta, which is part of the historic Métis Nation homeland. We would also like to acknowledge these lands are the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Siksika, the Kainai, Pagani, Tsutsina, and Stony Nakoda with whom we share this land on the basis of our historical and ongoing relationships. We would also like to say thank you to our First Nation friends, to the Métis settlements, and to the Métis brothers and sisters and families. We would also like to give thanks to our elders for the guidance and to Mother Earth for the time she allows us to be here to use her bounty. And now, folks, let's get the wheel squeaking. And as always, Lawrence, uh, I always have to say thank you, for Jason, for putting together all of our editing and our, and our connection. And here we are back on the squeaky wheel for an, uh, another week where we get a chance to talk about um, some of the things we, you and I were bantering around this last week. The fashion shows uh, are great for conversation. We want to talk a little bit about how at least the down south, they're starting to move forward. I know you and I are going to talk a little bit about hockey. We're going to talk a little bit about the energy world. And I'm excited because... We're bringing in, we always we always have some high profile guests and educators to me are always high profile because they're helping set the, the, not the standard, but how we're going to work to educate our youth, continue to educate ourselves and take the connection of information from the elders and, and combine that in the community. So we have our um, master's of education graduate student and research assistant at the University of Ottawa uh, Madeline McCrack McCracken, who's going to be coming on to our show. Boy, that's embarrassing. Yeah, I apologize. Yeah, don't uh, don't uh, screw up her name when you're speaking to her, okay? <laughs> I'll try to make sure. Madeline McCracken. Yeah. I said her there once. I'll make sure I hit it again right when we when we bring her on to the show. But so, Lawrence, uh, to jump into a couple of things, this week seemed like the Governor General has got be has either accepted some responsibility towards the negativity that was happening in her office or is she the fall person i have to think no matter what you played some kind of a role in this in especially if you're resigning and maybe that's the best course of action well i did adjudicate their dance um scholarship a few years ago the governor general awards and was happy to award somebody from the national ballet canada but no i had nothing to do with uh for <laughs> resigning or any of the okay, scandals so, that were happening there. At so that wasn't time. you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. But I, I mean, you know, it is a comment on, you know, what, you know, could really go wrong in, in an office, you know, in, or in an environment uh, where you are entitled. I'm sure you, you feel that uh, I could go the extra mile with the, these individuals no, with no repercussions, right? And, and people have to understand that you can't do that. It's not a, not a good look, right? I'm surprised there wasn't a time, because I don't recall a time where, she's, where she, you know, put her hand up and said, we can do better, I can do better. Right. And even at least Trudeau, he even he throws that out, you know, for every moment. It's, well, we could do better. We all have to do better. Okay, but in your case, you've been saying it a long time, help us understand how Canada is moving forward better. I don't really recall her saying that. I don't, I don't recall too much conversation. It just seems as though there were some accusations, there were some concerns, there were some issues. Yeah. A short period of time goes by, and now all of a sudden she's decided, I guess it's in the best interest of her role for the Governor General to resign. Yeah, and it's, you know, and then Judo... Justin Trudeau's comment that, you know, it's about the vetting process that has to be better, you know, type thing. And, and I'm like, okay, well, he said that when the We Charity thing yeah. happened too. So, you know, yeah. when everything yeah, goes wrong, you can't better. just go back to the vetting process. We got to make it yeah. better, right? But, yeah, make it better then. Be a part of that. Um, the uh, Hitting back once more again on the fact that things are starting to sort themselves out down south, the energy world. We have a lot of energy partners we have a lot of groups thank you to all of the um supporters uh i consider them shareholders in in the alberta indigenous conversation 
the support that we get from energy groups, they are, boy, they're, Alberta is in a tough time. Mm. Obviously, we, we have enough trouble, it seems like, getting, a, getting sponsorship or support from the East, um, though we typically end up sharing our resources throughout all of Canada. The decision by the federal, the American federal government is really going to be impactful again. How do we navigate that? Yeah, I mean, if you live in Alberta, you kind of hear the narrative quite a, in, in quite a different atmospheres, you know, coffee shops or at home or, you know, those places now and, and or on social media. But it, it's really about picking, you know, either you want transformable change or, or disruptive change in, in energy and you want more, uh, I guess, climate, you know, environmental energy and how you produce that versus, you know, what they're doing now. And you really need a really hard balance between both currently because you can't just get rid of, of either side entirely. They both have to merge and connect and work together because it is, it is important, the air, land, and water. We understand that, the environment, you know, from an Indigenous perspective. But we also understand that without the economics um, for Western Canada, which pretty much bleeds into the East, well... If you put a halt on that, you won't have programs for the community. You won't have a lot of things that benefit that option just by deleting it entirely. So you really need to have a, a healthy balance between environment change and what pipelines are doing. Because we, we want to make sure pipelines are, are doing the best they can environment-wise. And once they're gone, we have a place for newer energy energy sources but we need to have that time of transition and that's what we're in right now and it's going to be a rough change i think for a lot of companies out there good point and you know what ends up happening i think a lot is somebody uh, captures the idea of well there's conversation about solar let's just use solar let's only use solar and we'll solve the energy crisis well it takes so much energy to create solar panels to capture solar, you're putting the cart, you're putting the Métis cart well ahead of the person pulling it or the oxen or the horse carrying it. It's a long analogy. But you're putting a lot in, in front just because you think that this technology is going to solve everything. And you're right, the transition, and, and people should be involved in the conversation of, trans, of the transition as we move towards sustainable energy sol uh, solutions. But right now, folks, there aren't just enough uh, environmental solutions to all of a sudden just say, continue your lifestyle with no changes. There's enough energy. They're just... Yeah, and, science and there's, a cost, there's a cost to solar energy too. Like people don't yeah, consider, yeah. you know, like, so technology, if it's processed and manufactured to support oil and gas, well, yes. But now you're talking about manufacturing and processing for another technology well that costs money right so yeah you you really have to understand there has to be a healthy balance when you transition you can't just cut it off entirely yeah now i guess if we want to consider de good decision makers seems like the calgary flames right now are, have some pretty good decision makers montreal canadians seem to have a few the oilers not so much Perhaps those should be the people we're putting into the governor general's roles because they're making good decisions. It seems as though in order to hit a little bit on our sports, there's no doubt. And we talked last week about the unique challenges for professional athletes to not play in front of anybody, but I'm pretty excited to see the success. Um, definitely in our little community here. Sure. I want to see all Canadian teams do good. Uh, that's my favorite part of NHL hockey. And I hope somebody from the NHL doesn't slap me on this one, but, or uh, down South, but I do like seeing all Canadian teams doing well. And my heart is here in Alberta, but yeah, I think uh, it's actually already pretty exciting. Yeah. Somehow I mean, Vancouver's not doing so well. Yeah. I mean, I like to see the rivalries between Canadian teams. I think that's important. I mean, we saw a, a huge altercation between Winnipeg and Ottawa, and I thought it was great last night, right? <laughs> but, I mean, yeah. that's old-school hockey, and that's what we like to see. But at the same time, the business of hockey always happens in the off-season. That's when the trades happen. The mm -hmm. trades that happen mid-season don't really have too much of an effect on a season. It's the ones they do off-season. You know, so people, 
you know, have to take, take that into effect. If you trade and you make all these, you know, good deals, well then yeah, things will, things good will happen, but it's like playing the lottery too sometimes. And it's exciting. I know it's <laughs> hockey's part of our economy, part of Edmonton's economy, all the towns that have a, a hockey teams, the exception of the center of the universe, Toronto, well, maybe even Vancouver, uh, they seem to manage quite well without, but you know, we focus on this. I miss the, the connection that we get. And I, I don't want to belabor the fact that of course we all miss the connection, but I do miss going to games and I do miss that, that excitement. And I want the players to know that, that we all want to get back there too, because we enjoy it just as much. Yeah. Uh, Fashion show, Lawrence. Yes. I know you You often talk a little bit about some of the things that are happening within our region. Um, maybe hit on a few points, but then I wanted to, before we bring Madeline McCracken in, uh, I'd like to just, because uh, it sounds like the fashion show is moving forward. So yeah. maybe talk about a few things that are happening. Yeah, I mean, we went through our adjud- adjudication process. We're, you know, doing promo video. We're looking at uh, doing workshops for the uh, participants uh, then they receive the blanket and then they come up with a final product. And I know we'll be doing all that video stuff later on, but uh, yeah, we're looking forward to that. I mean, we have uh, a good dozen of individuals that are ready to go here to start putting their scissors to the cloth. They got to go through a little bit of Métis workshops, of course, um, even though they are Métis people, but you never know who we get in the room. we got to make sure everyone's on the same level and then design these clothing. And, and part of that is uh a Hudson's Bay Company blanket history too as part of those workshops. So I'm looking forward to uh, being a part of all that. Well, and you know, I'm looking forward to being a part of it because I, being my own little artist in my own band and my, and this and that, and it, all of a sudden it just came to me. I'm like, you know, what would be something kind of fun? I don't want to give away what my plan is, but I threw an idea in there and it seems like somebody liked it. So to the folks out there, uh, any chance you get to participate, you may not think that your idea is the best. You may not think that you are hundred percent sure of what you're going to do, but there's always support out there. And I think that um, thanks to the groups that are sponsoring Lawrence, thanks for, for that fantastic video you did regarding the, the idea of the Capote and, and, and Bernie for the, for the connection on that. I'm excited and, and I'm excited to, to, you know, throw, throw my idea around, but uh, any other thing you'd like to talk about that's, uh, hitting home right now before we bring Madeline. No, I think this is a, uh, I think it's all good. Um, we look forward to more conversations and more uh, people subscribing. Number one, you know, hit subscribe, you know, you will be on the, on your screen or at least for a half hour to 40, sometimes 50 minutes if we sometimes choose, but yeah, not, we don't ever go past the hour. Of course, that's, that's the mark where it may be a little bit too long, but that might be a little bit too long, but yes. And, and as always, you look fantastic again, Lawrence. Let's take this time because I see we have our, uh, our guest on and uh, let's, let's uh, welcome Madeline McCracken to the show. Well, and here's the time we get our opportunity, Lawrence, as we were conversing to bring on our guest. Uh, now I'm just going to throw this out there, but it's Miss Madeline McCracken. Yes, it okay. sure is. The, um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't wish to be presumptuous, but I'm going to throw out a few of the accolades to a all educators, but also you have you're working or you have your master's in education, you're a graduate student. Oh, I guess that would probably help uh, explain that. And uh, eventually I want to get into the conversation about being a research assistant at the University of Ottawa. Now here on the squeaky wheel. Welcome. Welcome. We our listeners. Um, we're enjoying that, uh, though. Most of the time, it's very easy to get into a conversation about the pandemic and the world around it. And the fact that you are likely at home is going to be part of that conversation. Um, But it's exciting for us that we try to have broad uh, areas of discussion. And this is a really, really important one, uh, I find, when it comes to educators and us on the squeaky wheel, really trying to work at connecting to our youth. Mm -hmm. And we often talk about sharing the message of our elders. But... I want to hear a little bit from you um, before we jump into some of the conversations about the research and some aspects. uh, Are you comfortable? I'd like to hear a little bit about your journey because the the more I've read about you and and the information in your history, you're obviously very proud of a a Métis background. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey? We've seen a lot of guests who talk that generations before us, it was very different it's getting easier or hoping the message is getting to the youth. It's okay to say, yeah, I'm Métis. Tell us about that journey because educators are very good 
<laughs> helping explain that. <laughs> well, uh, Kachi Marci uh, for for the introduction to you, and, and it's an absolute honor to to be able to talk about this with you. And I couldn't imagine a better place to do it. So <laughs> why not? Let's go. Um, <laughs> so my journey is very interesting uh, with coming to my identity and being very proud of who I am, especially now. Um, I would have to give my recognition to my mother. Um, she's a part of the generation, I think, that were still closeted um, to be truly proud. And I believe that it's because of the racisms that she's also faced too. Uh, she definitely does look more representative of being Indigenous, of being Métis. Um, she's been name called profusely within her upbringing. And for us to then be proud of who we are today as my brother, my sister, and myself, um, it was a journey to do so too, because she didn't tell us for a little bit uh, just what she faced until we were at an age that we could really take this in and what this responsibility now means for us. So that's why I think with being able to be so connected and so proud, it's because of what my mother faced and the resiliency that she holds and be able to tell us to this day, be proud of who you are, practice culture, connect with the land, connect with our relations and ensure that you take this on but for me, because of my privilege and what I hold, um, I recognize, okay, well, this is who I am and I will ensure that I respect everything that I've ever been given, especially for coming to where I am and the relations I've, I've held to and also with connections I've built as well with, with community. And also the Blackfoot community here too has been very um, embrace of, of, of me too. Uh, there's, there's been a couple elders that have taken me under their wing and I, I've always been so appreciative and so honored with that. But of course with COVID, the only way that we can still connect is still with online. And even with this conversation, it still feels connective because at least we're able to hold conversa conversations and share stories. So I think my journey is still ongoing. Uh, I think we are called the found generation uh, from what I've been hearing through the grapevine, which I appreciate. And I think it's because of the reclamation of being able to feel proud and to feel honored and to truly embrace what culture has to give to us, especially as Métis people. And we're very resilient, we're very proud. And I think our, our culture and our continuous ability to be able to teach, especially to our kids and to our youth. And that's why I'm primarily inside education too, is because I really care about the youth and I care about what their perspectives are. And I, I care about them feeling proud of who they are and everything that it has to bring with culture. There's also responsibility. So it's, yeah, it's very, it's very deep. It hits very deep with me, especially with my relations and also with my mother too. So the, um, I, I think, and Lawrence, I'd, I'd like to know your opinion on this too, because we hear that message uh, a number of times that um, uh, that we're finding the youth are finding it easier because that generation before them took a fair brunt of it. But as you said, the found generation trying to navigate what your what your responsibility is supposed to be now is a, is a big one, and honestly, even the word privilege. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it gets thrown around in a in sort of uh, maybe unfairly or fairly to uh, based on white privilege, and uh, then the conversation of where does indigenous privilege should it lie, where does it lie? It's not necessarily a term that I'm super familiar with on how to use it properly. But as I say to anybody in any situation, if you're willing to be in the conversation, you're going to learn something, mm -hmm. and um, learning. <laughs> definitely easier to learn from academics and, and teachers but Lawrence um, maybe talk just a little bit too about uh, that that identity because we seem to see that a lot yeah I mean the terminology is where the terminology terminology is so I mean we're either the hidden generation we're the lost generation mm -hmm. if you you stand on both sides you know you were you were hidden for a reason there was a there was a context to it there was a you know, back in those, in the generation above us, there was a lot of racism, discrimination right. that people had to make a, a conscious choice for their families to protect them. Yeah. Right. And, and that's, 
that has to be acknowledged on, on why and, and understanding why it's so important to work with Métis Nation people and Indigenous folks, right? So, you know, you know, I look at that context of identity. Um, yeah, we're going through a little bit of that hump now, but we are definitely, and I like that term found generation. I know it's relatively new, but it definitely is uh, on our scope right now of where we're headed as a, a new generation. So before I jump into the next question about the research side of it, can, actually, could you maybe help educate us so that we should continue to share that message? Maybe just explain a little bit about the found generation, because that's actually, that's funny, that's, that's new to me. And this is, this is a great chance for me to learn. Sure, absolutely. So to my understanding of what, what the found uh, generation truly means is our ability, because of what our ancestors were able to do for us, we're able to go on a path a, set a little bit easier. I think. And I think that's why I connect privilege. And it's because, wow, okay, we are able to go on this path because of all the hard fought battles, internal, external to other folks to really be proud of our identity and be proud of our culture and be able to practice culture as well. So with being able to be found, it's because of that resurgence of how many of us, I've had many conversations with my friends who are also my age, give or take, and <laughs> we, we have these conversations together and how we're all finding everyone is just on their journey to connect. But there's this inherent calling to want to connect that we're all feeling this. And it's because of our ability now to be able to seek these resources much easier. And there's also more prominence. And it's because of you folks too, of what you do with the Métis Nation and also your conversations of what you're holding every single day too. It's because of you folks, also my ancestors and, and everyone's ancestors here too, of what everyone has done. So we're honoring that as we are moving forward within being found and being proud uh, to be able to then share what we're learning and share how we're feeling and sharing this expression and and it's really like i feel very energized and i feel very passionate about it just because i am feeling so proud and that's what our ancestors really wanted from us too is, is to feel proud of our identity and that that's that's elusive to the metis sashes it's it's what we should be sharing and it's definitely a, a form of identity to to share with one another yes this is who we are uh, this is a, a way to identify ourselves as as peoples and as relations to one another as well so it's uh i guess that's my interpretation of feeling found being found and of course everyone's just on their journey with with being able to reclaim and to reconnect but at least folks are feeling comfortable and feeling like they have the ability to do so. And I think that's really important. And, and I, I love, I, and I actually, I use the term journey. I think it is, it is such a profound, a powerful term because we find regardless of where you are in any minority group, whether or religious group or, or culture group um, or just, or interest group, when you, it's, it's your journey because everybody's at a different stage. But I always tell people, I hope you're on the positive side of your journey or are working towards the positive side, because if it's your journey, don't spend as much time on the negative. Mm -hmm. It's your journey. Find the way. And for some people, it moves slower. And some people, they can, they can accept that journey. And I, I do know our physical characteristics when it comes to different cultures. Obviously, it's telling, but that doesn't mean it tells the whole history. So um, I wanted to ask you a question about, so you're participating with research with Dr. Nicholas Ingafuk, I hope I said that properly, and conducting work on projects aimed at support teacher education and Indigenous perspectives. Now, I want to try and break that down a little bit so that maybe you could talk about not just the aspect of that relationship, but then how, how does the online side of it work? But at what age are you trying to capture? <laughs> is it the young? Is it the middle? Is it, is it old age like Lawrence? Or is it, <laughs> is it our elders? Right. Yeah, I'd, I'd be very curious because, of course, um, we try to reach an audience that's participatory for, for everybody. But we know, uh, in, in a sense, youth do a better job of paying attention to the online media and, and connection. So we're doing a good job there, and hopefully they're helping steer the elders. But maybe talk a little bit about that research. 
Absolutely. In order for me to do so, I do have to share a story. Um, <laughs> Please do. <laughs> so when I when I first started um, my journey as becoming an educator, I wanted to be an educator ever since I was eight years old. It was just a calling to me and it was definitely something that I knew that should be part of my path. And so I was able to honorably achieve that goal. And I graduated from Mount Royal University in 2019. And I was also honored by Métis Sash too. So that, that was a really meaningful experience for me. But when I was learning to become a teacher, you have to go through practicums. And within that experience, that's when you really get to learn from the kids and you get to learn about how you want to be as a teacher, what your philosophy is and what you care about. So being the proud Métis that I am, I shared my identity with the teaching staff at the, at the schools that I worked at. And then I noticed that a lot of the educators actually asked me for Indigenous-based resources. So I thought, that's interesting. So there's a need here. And the need is actually quite exceptional of how many educators approached me to ask me questions even about reservations. Uh, you know, and that's, of course, the American term. We say reserves. But that's the way that that educator formed that question. So I thought that was really interesting. And they also asked me about treaties. And they asked me about, you know, what reserves are near us and what were residential schools. So. For an educator to ask me this, and of course, I'm, I'm still a practicum student. I still didn't necessarily label myself as an educator. However, in that moment, I did. And I was like, you know what? There's a major need and there's a major expression that can really be foundational for educators to take this journey. And for this educator to feel comfortable enough to also ask me these questions, I thought that was actually wonderful. I know that some folks might feel like, oh, wow, like that that's pretty, you know, I, I don't feel totally comfortable asking me like asking questions like that. Right. Um, but for me, I took that. OK, this educator wants help. This educator wants support and they find comfortability with being able to approach me. So um, with with that story now shared. I then applied for my Master of Education and I knew at the heart of it, it's because I wanted to teach and support educators in teaching Indigenous perspectives and knowledges in appropriate ways where it really captures our identities um, holistically but also inclusively and, and does so where it doesn't appropriate because I know that that's also been big with a couple conversations I've been a part of too but it's, it's more so coming from a place of appreciation and, and honoring the perspectives and ensuring that you're teaching things truthfully, historically relevant, and also with the actual perspectives of folks that have gone through these situations. And of course, that's where we have elders too that are able to share what they've experienced. And of course, what their ancestors have also experienced too. So we kind of get to see that holistically in that way. Um, but when it comes to educators with taking on this responsibility, it's interesting because there's kind of an uncomfortability with then teaching Indigenous perspectives because I'm not a part of that culture. I'm not a part of that identity. Where do I have a place here to be able to talk about that? And there's this one researcher I really do admire and I really look up to, and his name is Dwayne Donald, um, and he's Pop Chase Cree on Treaty 6 territory. And he has brought up this wonderful work called Ethical Relationality. And it talks about how folks can take the responsibility to honor their perspectives as a settler and be able to then still acknowledge the perspectives of indigenous peoples, Métis people, First Nations people, Inuit people, uh, to then come to a place of respect, responsibility, and be able to go move forwards together in relations. And he says that that's really important prior to reconciliation to actually be made and to be set is because that relation is actually foundational. And it's really important uh, to be able to see these ways and move in these ways that really support folks to get to the place where we need to be in order to move forward together. And then that's how reconciliation can possibly occur, right? So, of course, other folks will have different perspectives in regards to reconciliation, as we all see that it's, it's a, I, I, I believe it's moving. It's like a water. It, it flows, 
admit sometimes there's harsh tides, sometimes there's not so harsh tides. So it really does depend. But as long as folks are coming in it with intentions of love, appreciation, respect, I feel like that can only guide them to positive influences and positive ways to move forward and to to work with it together. Before we talk about age, Lawrence, that Madeline brought up a really interesting point. How do teachers teach if you're not from the culture or have a lot of that awareness? Does at, at a provincial level, is there conversation sometimes about how are we gonna we there's conversation about how and should and can we and will we talk about residential schools? Is there a conversation of who should share it? Because that's a really interesting point, Madeline. Uh, that, that sounded like an interesting article or, or, or presentation that your friend had sent. That, that is a challenging subject. We obviously know that in misappropriation in any aspect is very delicate right now. And what's our expectation? And is that, if, if I give Lawrence some time, I'd like to know a little bit more about how you think we can maybe utilize some of those skills and then get back to both the ages and such. Well, I think, you know, I think it's a wonderful concept, you know, Madeline has, has laid out and certainly, you know, changes to the curriculum has to come from a different area. Um, acknowledging what reconciliation is, that comes from a certain area of the Alberta education. And, and uh, the calls to action are very, very clear on how, you know, and it even is labeled on how you address these issues within education and training, right? So, um, as long as the school is willing to go that step for indigenization and their, some of their policies, um, but Alberta education, we, you know, in my opinion, is, is, um, is a, a, a system of bureaucracy in a sense that there's different divisions. And once you go over here and convince them, you got to go over here and convince these people over here. And it's not just the umbrella people, people automatically think, right? So, it's navigating the education system, making sure everybody's addressing this policy of, of change and addressing this policy of, of uh, reconciliation. And hopefully that transfers to the teachers too, because they're part of the change also, right? And how do you mentor those teachers so they're teaching the right curriculum? Um, is it the Moodle? Is that going to work? Or is it is something else that we can put in place that, to initiate that conversation with them, to put it in their lesson plan and deliver it to the students. So you have to have buy-in from top to bottom all the way. And that's just the necessary challenge that we do have currently with uh, Alberta Ed. But, uh, you know, Madeline is right. We can design a program. Uh, we can think of an indigenization because we know we have that uh, um, expertise at the table. But really, at the end of the day, it has to be those policymakers that decide to let it in. Mm, true. Good point. Um, so yeah, maybe Madeline, can you talk a little bit about then what's your experience when it comes to some of the research that you guys have been doing in teacher education for the right tools for the ages or what, what will happen in that kind of case? I love how you're asking this question because I always believe that everything's connected. Only yesterday did I lead a, uh, collaboratively lead, um, a wonderful webinar with the Caring Society. And of course, that's run by uh, Dr. Cindy Blackstock, who is an advocate for child welfare, of course, and marked number 27 for McLean's uh, top 50 people of, of Canadians uh, for 2021, which is absolutely astonishing and wonderful. And I feel absolutely honored to work with such a profound organization to, to advocate for, for the welfare of First Nations, uh, Métis and Inuit youth uh, on reserve off reserve. So with this being said, um, the webinar that I led collaboratively was actually directed for educators to take up the campaigns of the Caring Society within their classrooms. And we focused on, I'm a witness, and we did focus on have a heart day. and when it comes to being able to connect activities and lessons teachers look towards that more so i know that within my experience i googled a lot for lessons plans for ideas and and looking for ways that i can incorporate meaningful and important conversations within my classroom so of course I had to do my research well for that, not just Google, of course, but like, you know, yeah. I actually looked at articles and, you know, I, I, I got ideas. Yeah. <laughs> we always just say Google. Just yeah. Google. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so with that though, 
um, we were able to really look at and investigate the importance of how easy it can be for settler educators to be able to take up these concepts. And when we're able to do so, there's a responsibility that then they share alongside, because in order for reconciliation to truly be effective and to work, teachers have to take that responsibility on themselves. But that's gonna look different for every single one of them. So I do always encourage folks to look at that within themselves and what they really want to see from that. Um, but with that though, it's really important because with the work of the Caring Society, they're now moving towards supporting educators and supporting these teachings within the classrooms so that children can also reap the rewards of what they're going to be actionably seeing and being able to then advocate for, of course. Um, they do do a lot of letter writing campaigns as well uh, to the, you know, to MLAs, to, to minister offices and to legislative beings. Um, so with that, it's, it's an actionable process and kids feel very impassioned about advocating for indigenous peoples when they find out what we faced and yeah. what we continue to face to this day. So they get really, they re get really engaged within this work because they, they say that they want to help, they want to support, and they also want to ensure that First Nations, Macy and Inuit youth have the same equitable resources that they receive um, on every single day. So, you know, my work then, sorry, I, I, like I said before, um, <laughs> I had an elder tell me it was really sweet and it makes me feel really good about it. Whenever I go on tangents, is ancestors speaking through me. So. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, I know I also know. <laughs> well, Ross must be really close to that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there, there's a responsibility on my behalf to ensure that we're you know timely but also enjoying the conversation but you're you're the it the respect to it's not sometimes tangents it's actually things we do also need to talk about because they're important uh you know we can only capture so much in in so much time and so some of the things that i really wanted to focus on was that the uh, and, and picking up from you was the how do we teach teachers how do we teach ourselves when do we accept the role of what we're doing. And as you pointed out, a very important thing for teachers. And the thing I also say to anybody is if somebody asks you the question respectfully, they want to be a part of the conversation. And I think we all have a responsibility then to say, well, let me understand it because I'm happy to share it. But I also say the first thing I generally say in any conversation with anybody is I'm not an expert mm. and I have my opinion, but I also am willing to share and have a conversation and I'm willing to have come in with an open mind. And if somebody changes my mind, it may change again, but I'm going to do it respectfully because I want to hear where it's coming at from, a, from other people's perspective uh, and, and whether it's a culture thing or whether it's other choices in life. But um, and it seems you're well connected with academia and there it's, you know, your name had been brought up before just in some conversations regarding um, the what's happening in our province or what's happening when it comes to indigenous uh, things that will affect in, indigenous relationships with the government or mm -hmm. or energy or the mines that people are coming up does does your relationship with the university and your relationship with university of ottawa and your success do those interconnect because you're very passionate about the culture and and metis culture and all culture and that aspect of education, do they interlock? Do they over, do they connect some places? They do. Um, I always find it that it's like a duality and, and it's, it's a, it's a kind of a, my pathway to navigating that duality. So what is my place academically and what is my still relations to the land and to community? Mm -hmm. So what does that actually look like? Well, it looks like the work that I'm actually providing and sharing and communicating with community still because I think that's really important because yes it's important to talk about these things but what is the actual actions of what we're then saying and how do we back that up right so I believe that holistically I really want to ensure I check myself a lot I have a lot of conversations again with with elders I have a lot of conversations with my supervisor and um, also with my research team in general, they've been very supportive and very embracive uh, of my identity and 
they're wonderful allies with that too. And I find, again, because of being found, I'm going to say that again, it, it, it really does allow me to feel like I can navigate it easily. Yeah, of course, there's hard days and it's really important to check on oneself during these hard days and connect with family and connect with land. Um, luckily, we're very close to um, uh, BAMP being, you know, recognized as Stony Nakoda <laughs> land too. And with that, it's, it's, it's at least a way to connect with nature and connect with relations and to really get out of the head and to, to just honor where we are and, and, and really feel um, appreciative and gra grateful. I, I like to say grateful and gratitude a lot too. And in regards to how I navigate this. You, and you carry a strong energy. What would be something because of where you sit in the academic and the, and your studies and your support for teachers uh, and other teachers and educating them, what would be one of those messages? And is it, is it one you'd already said, what's one or two of the really strong messages about how do teachers learn about another culture? What is, what is some of the best tools? Obviously asking somebody, is there another tool? Is there another way? Something you'd recommend? Something the province should hear? <laughs> I honestly think it's really important to read our stories. Mm. Also. Um, there's a wonderful book. Uh, I've, I've mentioned this a lot, even on my podcast too. Um, and it's, it's by Jesse Thistle. And it's called From the Ashes. And he's Métis Cree. Um, his perspectives and his journey is quite foundational and very important to listen to. Um, I also encourage folks to, to really, I've thought about this a lot. I actually have, because I think folks think that it's hard to engage with folks from a culture mm -hmm. or from a nation because they don't know how. Yeah. And I honestly say it's, it's a call, it's a phone call, it's an email, it's a making of relations. And as long as your intentions are whole, they're from the heart, and you want to connect, I think you're just going to have a, a, just a positive experience because that's all, at least from, from speaking from my experience, that's all I want too is when folks are reaching out to me to make relations, I hope their intentions are and for the majority of them, I've seen that they always are. So, you know, honoring that and really accepting that. So it's just a phone call. It's a, it's an email. And with that too, it's also reading books and reading stories and also engaging in community in these kinds of ways. Well, and, and uh, I think, uh, and I want to ask you a little bit, we'll close it with your podcast, just for a shout out to that. The, um, that's a very important message. And Lawrence, I wanted to ask you, or maybe you could, with thanking our guest, the, um, we definitely do a job. I always tease you about the fact that you have, anybody can call you and you'll go for coffee at any time when it's not COVID, but um, that's important. That's an important statement. It's a simple statement. Folks, it's okay to pick up the phone and it's okay to pay attention. Um, and and I, I apologize. What was the name of your podcast again? It's called Educate uh, the Earth Research Time, and we unpack research articles, and, and we, I invite guests to unpack them with me, and then we relate it to world experiences and then also to personal experiences. It was funny. I, I saw that, that title. I, I, at time, I, for whatever reason, wasn't connecting it with the idea of the podcast. It, it was the title. And I'm like, oh, right. That's exactly what it is. But Lawrence, perhaps you could thank our guests because I think we're providing not just something to all the Métis people, definitely to any educator out there who wants to learn on some of the tools. And the simplicity of, yeah, sometimes just ask the question and ask it politely. I want to uh, thank Madeline for, for speaking to us today. And um, maybe one day we can be guests on the podcast or at least make an appearance. I'm not a research driven person. I'm sure um, Ross is too, but um, you know, it is, it's about supporting the teachers and in, in the best way they can. So we, they can deliver to these students. So they understand. I mean, we all know what uh, grade three social studies was when they introduced Métis. Well, they didn't really say Métis. They refer to us in other terms and it was a different narrative, right? So we want to encourage these teachers that the, this is who they are and this is what they did. And, and what you see nowadays is the infrastructure that was laid out for because of them. And, and, uh, we move on to the next subject, but really 
it really needs to be a, a stronger Métis focus in terms of the curriculum and supports for teachers. But no, I want to thank Madeline for being here today and uh, wish her all the best in the future. And we'll see her again, maybe in person. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you again, Madeline. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your, uh, your contribution to education and, and to our students and to the other educators out there. It's you, Madison, folks. I really do appreciate this opportunity. And it's been a humble honor to be able to talk with you both. And I really enjoyed this experience. So, uh, to you, Merci. Thank you so much, Messi. Bye. Lawrence, the, um, her ability to express how to connect with other teachers is, is a phenomenal strength. Uh, it, it's actually, you know, for, for, for not having the long tenured history uh, of, you know, 30 years working at universities, she is so eloquent about what is actually the simplest thing. If you want to ask the question, do some reading yourself, learn a little bit, and then be polite and ask. People do want to share the story. And the good people say, I'm not as familiar, but I'm willing to learn too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, what she's, she's talking about is, you know, passion and it's about pride. And, you know, a lot of us members, like I was born and raised, so were you and, and Jason Chernow also at the same time. Well, now it's time for us to uh, be proud of it and accept that, hey, let's uh, move forward on, on uh, supporting our, our education system. Because we're going to be better. Yeah, let's continue to keep the conversation going, um, and 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 encourage people to ask questions. And I think I think we do a good job that here on the Squeaky Wheel, folks. We are always recommending. And and Madeline had reached out to us, and and uh, and I know Jason had connected with her in order to ensure that all this was um, that we're going to hopefully share the right message that we want to share. And I knew based on reading her information or bio, it, it was going to be so easy. She's she's very intelligent. And she's very connected. The um, one of the other things I guess I wanted to ask you too now, Lawrence, was what would we like to see? What's one of the messages regarding um, to our province? We did talk a little bit about it with, with Madeline, but how do we uh, get the province to start the conversation about where we're at with the Métis now? Or do we focus on what we've learned in history because now is complicated? But history is still history. Well, recognizing it's not like the we, yeah, you know, we've been speaking to the Alberta education for years. Like this isn't yeah. a new concept. Um, mm -hmm. Some have, you know, very open to it, and then some have these deaf ears that happen, right? All of a sudden, and we are going through a bit of a deafening right now with the Alberta government, and that needs to change because. You know, when you change a curriculum or you, you don't want to mention residential school, you don't want to do all these things and stuff that we've already worked on and, and emphasized for, for years that these things need to be talked about. Well, it's for a reason. It's not because we want to make all, all this guilt ridden things along the landscape. It's a part of reconciliation. People need to understand what went on so it doesn't happen again and again and again. We can't erase the history. Right. So that's, uh, you know, the strongest statement I can make to the Alberta government right now in terms of education, but they really need to take their best steps forward. And, and um, I guess my message in some cases is as we, as you try to move forward, instead of thinking you have to move the ship from one side of the ocean to the other, just get the ship moving. If you want to talk about the things that, that the Métis community has said, this is, we're aware of this, we're comfortable with this, this is factual information. Start someplace, right? Don't just yeah. think that, well, we're not going to include any education until we know the whole story. As, I, as we often comment, we're still trying to learn the whole story. Our elders are still trying to share yeah. the information. We're all trying to learn it, but start the conversation someplace. And even if we make a mistake, they'd made a mistake in the past of how the educator talk about residential schools. Okay except that we weren't correct in every aspect or the government or the teaching wasn't correct, but let's continue to move forward 
and have conversation. Uh, at the end of the day, um, you know, as Madeline pointed out, as long as we're having conversation, as long as we're engaged in the conversation, I think that that is this that is our biggest strength. So, folks, on the squeaky wheel here, I always want to do a big shout out to everybody who subscribed to us on YouTube. All you have to do is make sure that when you get on that little there's a little red box when you're on the um, on Google and you get to YouTube, and you click that little red box, you're gonna get us subscribed. Every subscriber that we get gives us a little bit more strength. It gives us our supporters, the awareness that we have the, the positive connection within our community and so we very much always appreciate it. I want to say thank you to Madeline again. I want to say thank you to Jason. Uh, looks like Lawrence, uh, due to the nature of the world of how sometimes the internet works, uh, wasn't able to finish the show with us today, but I'm sure we'll, we'll uh, I can guarantee we're going to hear from him next week. Folks, if you want to send us a question, continue, please send us our emails at tsw at metis3.org. You can always go to our website, www.metis3.org, and we're always willing to connect. We're always willing to share our time, and we always appreciate the time that you shared with us uh, uh, here on the Squeaky Wheel. From all of us at the Squeaky Wheel, from the President, Lawrence Gervais, from myself, Ross Memphis Pambrin at the Memphis Group, thank you for your time, and we look forward to seeing you next week.